We're here on the right day today because today we're starting a new sermon series to explore some of the life and death topics that we honestly don't often talk about very directly in the church these days. Questions like this, what is hell? What is heaven? What is death? What is salvation? These are all words that we use in the church, but we don't really sometimes talk very directly about what they mean. And since Wednesday marked the official start of summer, and since we've had our good dose of uh, 95 degree days already, I thought we might as well start with hell. So today, today we're starting with hell. So would you turn with me in your blue Bibles to page 1499? We're reading from the Gospel of Matthew in the third chapter, starting with verse 1. It's 1499. I, I love this image that um, John the Baptist uh, gives us of Jesus because it's not the, the timid, meek and mild Jesus that he paints. It's the Jesus carrying a winnowing fork, which is basically like a long pitchfork. Uh, Jesus with a pitchfork and uh, separating out the wheat and, wheat and burning the chaff. I mean, how, many, how many times do you see that in a pastor's office? Jesus with a pitchfork. You don't see that, right? You see Jesus meek and mild with the little children. So anyway... Here's what, uh, here's what Matthew has to tell us. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the desert of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the desert, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers. You know what a viper is? It's a poisonous snake. You brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. This is the word of God for us today, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, you won't be surprised to learn that there is a pretty strong relationship between what we believe about hell and how often we worship. In 2004, Gallup did a poll and found that almost all Americans who worship weekly believe in hell. That is 92%. But of those who worship only periodically, that number falls to 74%. And of those who worship seldom or never, only 50% believe in hell. So if those numbers hold true for us here today, then most of us are in the believe in hell camp. So if we really do believe in hell, and if Jesus talks about hell, why don't we talk about hell more often? Well, I think some of us are confused by all the figurative language that uh, we read about uh, hell in the Bible, and we just don't know how to talk about it. Some of us are confused by what we've heard about hell growing up, and we can't reconcile that with what we read in the Bible. But the vast majority of Christians who believe in hell are, I think, simply embarrassed by it. We know that God's nature is love, and we just can't wrap our minds around the idea of a place or a state of eternal punishment and suffering. 
So this morning I can't answer all the questions, but I'll do my best to untangle some of the misunderstandings that we have about hell and hopefully point in some helpful directions. As I do that, I want to acknowledge my indebtedness to a sermon that was first preached at Asbury Theological Seminary way back in 1969 by Dr. David Siemens, entitled, And the Door Was Shut. And I have used two of Dr. Siemens' illustrations uh, in my sermon, and with the permission of Asbury Seminary, I've also made some copies of the complete text of his sermon, and there, there should st still be some available on the um, semicircular desk by the front of the church. Well, some of the confusion surrounding hell comes from the things that we see on television um, or from reading some of the imaginative descriptions of hell in the world's literature. Like the one, the very elaborate depiction of hell by Dante, the 14th century Italian poet. Anyone read Dante's Inferno? Some of you have. Wanda has. Uh, my son Wes was required to read it, I think, in your, was it in your freshman year? Sophomore year in college. And uh, so I was kind of inspired to read it. I often read the books that my children are reading. And um, I was really intrigued in reading. It's difficult to read um, because it's translated uh, from the Italian. But I was really intrigued by the, the interweaving in his book of the Italian politics the Greek mythology, and just the vitriol against the Catholic Church. Um, Dante portrays hell as being ordered by a detailed hierarchy of sin and punishment, uh, with the entrance to hell being reserved for people who would ordinarily be very virtuous, except for the fact that they never got baptized. So they kind of get off light. They're in kind of the entranceway to hell. And then there's this... Um, complicated progression of guilt that leads down to the deepest part of hell, which is reserved for those guilty of treachery. Uh, at the very center of hell, the, the greatest traitor of all is Judas Iscariot, who Dante puts inside of Satan's mouth, where he is eternally being chewed on by Satan. <laughs> Isn't that absurd? It, it is an absolutely delicious poetic commentary on the thinking of Dante's day. And, and it had me uh, laughing out loud on more than one occasion as Dante would constantly take uh, some political opponent of his day and recognize him as he went through this tour of hell. Oh, I know you. You're my you know, political opponent. Um, you really should read it. But it has nothing whatsoever to do with the biblical description of hell. So if we're going to talk about hell in the Bible, we have to first recognize that there are quite a few different words, e either Hebrew or Greek words, that we translate in English as H-E-L-L. -L. It's really too bad that we substitute the word hell for all those other words because they usually don't really represent the same thing. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word Sheol referred to the land of the dead. And for the most part, that wasn't seen as a place of eternal torment for dead people. It was simply seen as a place where all people went when they died. Uh, in, in the English Bibles, we've translated the word Sheol as Hades, death, the pit, sometimes simply Sheol. So when we read something like Job 33, 28, he redeemed my soul from going down to the pit, we could substitute any of those other words. He redeemed my soul from going down to death. But what we really can't do is substitute some of those New Testament ideas about and images of fire and torment and judgment. Those really weren't in view there. In the New Testament, one of the Greek words translated as hell is Gehenna. Now, like much of the colorful language of the Bible, the term Gehenna was intended to be a metaphor. The word actually refers to the Valley of Hinnon, which was a garbage dump outside of Jerusalem. It's the same valley that was used for human sacrifices to Molech in the Old Testament times, one of the gods that idolaters were worshiping. And in the time of Jesus, there would have been smoldering fires 
and the rotting remains of animals as well as people who were deemed beyond the possibility of salvation sitting there in that dump. The stench would have been unimaginable. So when Jesus wrote in Matthew 5, 22, for example, that those who call their brothers or sisters fool will be liable to the hell of fire, what he actually said was, those who call their brothers or sisters fool will be liable to the hell of Gehenna. Or the, I'm sorry, be liable to the Gehenna of fire. Does that mean that Jesus didn't believe in hell? No, of course not. It simply means that Jesus, being the superb teacher that he was, reached for an object lesson near at hand to very clearly illustrate something so horrible that words can't adequately describe it. In essence, Jesus was saying this, the kingdom of hell is like a burning garbage dump full of smoldering fires and decomposing bodies. That's nice, isn't it? Something is lost in the translation. A more familiar biblical image for hell is the lake of fire appearing in Revelation 20:14, or the more general term used in the New Testament of eternal fire. Jesus used that image in Matthew 25, 41 in his teaching on the separation of the sheep and the goats. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, can we take from this that Jesus is assuring us that hell, in hell, the temperature will be greater than 75 degrees Fahrenheit? No. Of course, there could be fire in hell. But there are plenty of clues elsewhere in the Bible that suggest that eternal fire is really a metaphor to try to convey to us the extreme agony of being in hell. For example, my very favorite description of hell in the Bible is the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, maybe I, I like it so much because I can relate to it so much. <laughs> that phrase is sometimes combined with the image of eternal fire or sometimes with being tossed into the outer darkness. But have you ever wept and gnashed your teeth? Have you ever been so downcast and so without hope that um, you just had to weep and, and you, at least figuratively, were gnashing your teeth? I know I have. I mean, these are things that we do when we're under extreme duress, when the unthinkable has, has happened, and you can see no path forward, no hope for the future. So you might read past these passages where Jesus said, weeping and gnashing of teeth, to say something like this. The kingdom of hell is like having absolutely no hope, like having the weight of the world sitting on your heart and mind, like suffering the deepest mental anguish possible. Being cast into the outer darkness is a similar idea. When I read that phrase in the Bible, I think of being cast away from the company of everyone whom I love. Cast into a state of blindness with nothing beautiful to look at. Nobody to talk to. Nobody to care that I exist and nobody to care for. Being utterly alone forever. Now, I like my solitude, but even the most dedicated introvert really doesn't want that much isolation. Now take all those metaphors for hell and stack them all together. A burning garbage dump, a lake of fire, weeping and gnashing of teeth, being cast into the outer darkness, and still others like total annihilation. All those together, I believe, are only a pale reflection of the hell that Jesus warns us of in the Bible. Well, I've said before that much of the teaching in the Bible can be boiled down to simple contrast between two different things. And to a large extent, the biblical teachings about hell are like that too. They don't try to give us a scientific description of something which is fundamentally supernatural and beyond our mortal ability to understand. But they do make a simple contrast between living in the kingdom of God and living in the kingdom of Satan. If that's true, then one way we could imagine what hell is 
is to take away all the good things that we know are part of the kingdom of God. For example, try to imagine gathering up all the fruit of God's Spirit and then suddenly and eternally eliminating them from your life. So you might say, the kingdom of hell is like experiencing no love, no joy, no peace, no patience, no kindness, no goodness, no faithfulness, no gentleness, and no self-control forever and irrevocably. I don't know about you, but that sounds a lot like hell to me. So, if we can agree that hell is the absence of or the exclusion from the kingdom of God, then the question still remains. Who is responsible for all those who wind up being eternally separated from God? Isn't God ultimately responsible? Doesn't the existence of hell put a lie to the Bible's assertion that God is love? Well, David Siemens, in his sermon, And the Door Was Shut, makes a very, I think, compelling case that God always desires that we be included in the kingdom of God. But it is we ourselves who finally choose our own damnation. Here's this great story that he tells to illustrate the point. There once was a blacksmith. Remember what a blacksmith was? <laughs> Worked with metal. A man greatly skilled in his trade. He was so proud of his work that whenever he made anything, he always put a special mark on it. It was his trademark, and he was justly proud of that mark. An invading army came into his town. After a bloody battle, they seized the town and conquered the people. The blacksmith, together with a long line of prisoners, was put in chains and thrown into a dungeon. But the blacksmith wasn't worried. After all, chains were his specialty. He knew all about them, and he knew that if he could find the weakest link in that chain and exert the right amount of pressure on it from a certain angle, that the chain would snap and he could make his escape. So he waited until the guards were no longer there, and then he began to study the chain that shackled his legs. All of a sudden, his heart sank to the floor, and he uttered a cry of despair. For as he looked at the chain, he saw on the chain his very own trademark. He had manufactured that chain himself, and he knew that in it, it was not a single weak link. In unutterable anguish, he sank to the floor. He was doomed to slavery by an, by an unbreakable chain that he himself had forged. I believe that hell is the eternal separation from God in God's kingdom, brought about by our own selves as the inevitable outcome of our consistent decision to turn our backs on God and to serve ourselves instead. The Bible does not give us a scientific dissertation on exactly what hell is like, doesn't give us the GPS coordinates for hell, doesn't give us a detailed menu of services available there or punishments received there. It's enough for us to know that our time for deciding to be a follower of Jesus is limited. There will come a day when the door will be shut, like it was in the parable for the virgins who had not prepared by getting oil for their lamps. There will come a day when the failure of some to respond to the good news of Jesus will become fully realized in eternally bad news. But today is not that day for us. Today the good, day, the good news remains, and for everyone here, the door has not yet been shut. The good news is that Jesus still invites us to the wedding banquet. I don't think it's the fear of hell that is going to compel us to accept that invitation, but rather the love and the grace of Jesus. David Siemens closes his sermon on hell with this anecdote about C.S. Lewis. 
C.S. Lewis corresponded with a minister on the subject of eternal punishment in hell. With his clear and forceful logic, Lewis convinced the man that the teaching that I've talked about in this sermon was both reasonable and scriptural. And at last, the minister said to him, Okay, Dr. Lewis, I'm convinced. I think you're right. I do believe that Jesus taught this truth about hell. But there's something within me that cries out against it. I believe in it, but I must say that I would give anything. I'd pay any price to change it, to make it not true. It said that Lewis was very sober for a few moments. Then he turned to the man and said, Friend, that's exactly what God has done. He has given everything. He's paid an infinite price so that it doesn't have to be true of any person. And Jesus has paid the price and is extended to us in an invitation. He has set before us the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. In my mind, there's no question that God eagerly desires the full participation of all of us in the kingdom of God. But there is a question that remains. Do we desire it? Do we really desire it so much that we're willing to give up everything in order to follow Jesus? Or will we go away sad, like the rich young ruler, and inherit a place in the kingdom of hell where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth? The Bible teaches very clearly that Jesus will be our judge on the last day. But it also seems clear to me that the choice will be made first by us. Let us pray. Gracious God, for the saving and atoning, redeeming work of Jesus Christ, we give you thanks. Lord, we confess that on our own, none of us are worthy of the good gifts you have for us, both in this life and in eternity. But, Lord, we eagerly desire to be faithful and to claim the saving work of Christ. Lord, where our faith is not enough, we pray that you would increase our faith. We desire to be a part of the kingdom of God. Thank you for your great love that goes before us, goes behind us, and goes with us and around us. We love you.